as usual, I'll start with an announcement. Uh, just to remind you that we'll have uh, a reception today at 4 on the uh, terrace of the main building. This is this building here. And in case we don't have enough uh, reasons uh, to celebrate, uh, there is one more. Uh, yesterday was, uh, was uh, the birthday uh, of Dirac, and as per tradition, uh, the winners of uh, this year uh, Dirac medal are announced. Great. And here they are. Uh, Subir Sajidev, uh, Dam Tson, and Shang Gen Wen. Can you say it? All of the three are well known to this audience, both personally and by their our contributions. And uh, the citation for the medal is uh, for Nobel for, uh, for, for their um, um, contributions toward understanding of novel phases, I guess, in strongly interacting many body systems, uh, introducing original cross-disciplinary cross techniques. So this is very much at the subject uh, of this conference. So it's very nice that we're all here once it happened. We probably need to book the time for the next uh, workshop now. <laughs> okay, and please join me in uh, promote congratulations to Sabir, Damson, and Shaugenwe. So once again, uh, there used to be empty boards on the left and on the right of this auditorium. I think they are gone by now, but there will be movable uh, boards uh, in the lobby, so you'll have ample time uh, to mount your poster before 2.30 uh, today. And with that, I'm leaving the podium to uh, our local organizer, uh, Professor Fazio from I ICTP, who will be chairing this session. So it's a pleasure to welcome the first speaker of the section, Nathan Andre, and the talk will be about quench dynamics in the San Gordon uh, model. Thank you very much. Started five minutes later. So. Okay. Um, okay, it's a great pleasure to be here. This beautiful place to celebrate Pierce in particular. I will talk about a work that was done in a direction that has not been discussed very much thus far, but which I think is one of the main intellectual challenges of future condensed matter, namely non-equilibrium dynamics. So I will talk about quenches, and the work that I will describe was done with my student who is about to finish, Colin uh, Rylands. So, Non-equilibrium is, of course, a very old topic, going back at least to Boltzmann, but what has brought it to the forefront more in the last 10, 20 years is the ability to carry out very precise experiments where one looks at isolated systems where non-equilibrium effects are not washed out by coupling to environment such systems as, in particular, cold atom system, various nano devices, systems that are isolated and for which one has very fine control and one can pose questions in a very precise way. So one of the simplest protocols of carrying out non-equilibrium is called quench. What one does then, one starts with a system that is totally isolated, prepared in a particular uh, state, and then evolves it in time and asks very various questions. How does the system evolve? How do its properties change? How do, um, what is the entropy that is produced in the process, and so on and so forth. So um, one can do it in various ways. One way is to do with a time-dependent Hamiltonian. One prepares the system in a state A, evolves it, it reaches the state B, and one begins to ask questions. The quench that I'm going to talk about is called a sudden quench, where one uh, prepares the system in a particular state and turns on the Hamiltonian, a time-independent Hamiltonian, and allows the systems to evolve. And as I said, there are many experiments and even more questions. How does thermalization work? How does one reach thermal state if one does? There are no, more non-thermal state like 
non-equilibrium steady state, many states that are not equilibrium, and one has to ask the question what happens in the long time limit. How does one classify currents, entropy production, spreading of entanglement? So there are many, many uh, questions. Here is an experiment, one of the earliest ones, uh, which will be relevant to the work I'm talking about, where one prepares a system in a mod insulator um, and allows, so here is the mod, I, I'm reversing the time order. So here it is in a superfluid, uh, suddenly one raises the barriers, one, the Hamiltonian is a mod insulator, the initial step is a superfluid, how does the superfluid evolve under a mod like Hamiltonian? And one sees it evolves back and forth. That's because it's a finite time. Uh, the work that I'm going to describe is where one starts with a mod, a initial state, and evolves it under a superfluid Hamiltonian. A another famous experiment is the Newton's cradle, where one allows a gas of boson to bounce back and forth, interact, and one asks whether it's going to thermalize. Here's an experiment that I hope is going to be done because we are calculating what, how does the condo effect evolve in time. Uh, you have a lead, you have a dot which is isolated. At time t equals to zero, one lowers the barrier. The electrons begin to hop back and forth on the dot and the condo peak begins to evolve in time. How does the system reach its ground state. Okay, so one has many, many questions. One, I will focus on a particular question. Uh, what is the work done when you quench the system? So as you quench the system, you pump in a lot of energy into it in the form of work. So work is typically E final minus E initial. Remember that the system is isolated, so there is no heat flowing. But what is work uh, in a, a quantum system? It's, in fact, it's, uh, as was pointed out by Hengi et al., uh, it's a random variable. It evolves two measurements, an initial and final energy. In other words, I prepared the system initially in a state phi i, phi initial, with a given energy. Which, so the probability then is pi is one. And then I evolve the system and I do another measurement. I measure energy En with probability of the overlap phi I psi N absolutely square and it has energy En. So the final energy fluctuates. I could of course start from also an initial distribution, let's say finite temperature, but for simplicity I'll start with a well-defined initial state. So for a, such a quench, the work distribution is given by PW, namely the, amount, the probability to measure a certain work, is given by um, initial energy, final energy minus initial, initial energy um, being equal to W times the, all the probabilities that would lead to this result. So if you look at that, then you see that this uh, distribution of work has the form of a, a spectral function and it has many properties that follow just from its form. Uh, there is a, the work to begin with has to be larger than delta E, which is the difference between final ground state of the final Hamiltonian minus ground state, uh, minus the energy of the initial state. And um, there is going to be a delta function when the work is at this point, it's weighted by the fidelity, which is the overlap square between a initial and ground state. And uh, if the Hamiltonian is gapped, then there would be a continuum of excited states into which phi i can transition, and, the dub and we have to add to delta E the minimum amount of 2m, and then from there on, we'll have a continuum of states uh, of two particle 
spectrum. So the, there will be power-like behavior that one expects with some critical exponent alpha. Similarly, when we have four particles, we'll have another threshold with another critical exponents. If we have bound states, we'll have be able to transition to poles that corresponds to these bound states, and they will appear again in the um, distribution function. So there is a lot of work was done, particularly here at CISA, it started by Silva, Gambassi, Palmai, Sotiriadis, Musado, Calabrese, Gould. A lot of people worked and understood much of this. And there are many, many other questions. If the question is if one carries out a rever the, the processes in a reversible, irreversible way, is there en how much entropy is produced? Um, how the entanglement is uh, spreading. There are beautiful fluctuation theorems that relate various uh, equilibrium and non-equilibrium relations, uh, how the system moves forward or backwards in time, uh, questions that I'm not going to go into. Okay, so let me now begin by um, introducing the main actor, which is the Loschmidt echo. Loschmidt, of course, and his debates with Boltzmann have a long history. Here I'll simply define the Loschmidt echo as, I don't know why it's twice, a, the overlap a probability between the final state, which means phi i, which has been evolved by e minus i h t, and the initial state. And one can show easily that the prob work probability is just a Fourier transform of the uh, Goldschmidt, uh, of the Loschmidt uh, distribution. Uh, and what makes it non-equilibrium interesting and hard is that unlike thermodynamics, it doesn't probe only ground state and low-lying state. It probes the full Hil Hilbert space. So the Loschmidt amplitude, as you can see from this expression where I've just put in here a complete set of eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, wanders all around a Hilbert space, and it's characterized by probabilities uh, which tell us from what state we have started and what part of the Hilbert space we are going to probe. And such uh, time evolution may exhibit, uh, for example, a dynamical phase transitions. Um, namely, suppose I start with a system, let's take a simple model like a, a quantum, um, a, a quantum spin model, a quantum Ising model, where I prepare the initial state as being up, and then I propagate it with the Hamiltonian where the spin is down. So in one region it will be mainly the overlaps will place the state up and then there is another region in Hilbert space where the spins are down. So as it goes from one region to another region, there may be phase transition in time. But uh, whether such phase transitions occur or not is not only the property of the Hamiltonian as it would have been in statistical mechanics, it's also a dynamic property that is characterized by the initial state. It has to tell us where we start. And there are experiments that probe precisely the system that I was talking about, and you can see that in the case of um, the quantum Ising, the R, quantum phase transition, namely singularities in time. I will talk about another model, more complicated one, uh, which is the sine gordon model. So I have a quantum field theory uh, with uh, interacting quantum field theory with a cosine interaction. Uh, it's quite a ubiquitous uh, theory. It uh, describes many, many low energy. It's the low energy dynamics of many other systems, spin chains, 
interacting boson, the Bose-Hubbard model, uh, even quantum impurities could be related to um, sine Gordon. Of course, costally starless could be analyzed in this language. Turns out, of course, this model should be known is quantum integrable. Uh, Brothers Zamolochikov have already analyzed it in 78, but classically it was known earlier. It is equivalent to another model through bosonization to a model which is called the massive Turing model, where you have right and left movers, plus minus, you have a mass term, and you have a, a density density interaction. And there is a very precise way to relate the parameters of the theory here, which are m and beta, to the parameters here, which are m naught and g. Uh, now, this relationship is not universal. Both models are renormalizable field theories, and they need to be renormalized. And the way you renormalize affects uh, the precise relations. But uh, once you have decided what you are doing, it's well defined. So again, the Turing model is an integrable model, was solved by Birkenhoff and Thacker in 78. We know what the spectrum is. It uh, consists of solitons and anti-solitons uh, of mass m. m is not the same as the parameter m0 of the Hamiltonian. It's renormalized. This is the actual pole in the green functions. And for repulsive interaction, when beta is in the range, four beta square is between 4 pi and 8 pi, that's the spectrum. And we have, however, very complex scattering and very interesting S matrix. If we have attractive interaction, there are also bound states between solitons and antisolitons, which are typically called breather modes. And it's, there is a very interesting limit, obvious in the language of the Turing model, but in the language of sine Gordon, if we choose beta squared to be equal to 4 pi, this model is actually a free, firm, a, a free model. Namely, it becomes a free model where solitons and anti-solitons uh, go through each other freely. OK, so that's the model. And here is the quench I'm interested in. So this is the effective low energy of a Bose-Hubbard model. And as I said, the experiment has been done. Imagine that I start it here from a mod state and quench it. Uh, and then I'm going over to a superfluid uh, as time evolves. And I want to understand the dynamics of this. So the quench I'm going to do, of course, this is done in two dimension. I'll do my quench in one dimension. So imagine that my initial state is described here. The bosons are in the lattice, the potential is very high, infinitely high. And at time t equals to 0, I lower the barrier. Interactions become active. The, uh, the bosons begin to flow and interact and scatter. So here is the quench. It's a sudden quench. I start with an m square, which is the uh, amplitude of the potential, and lower it from infinity to a finite value. So I'm going from here to here suddenly. Another initial state would be very interesting is where all the bosons are on top of the hill. It's a maximal energy uh, eigenstate of the original Hamiltonian, or it's the ground state of the Hamiltonian where m squared is minus infinity, where I reversed the spin. So I, the quench that I'm going to do is from m squared being either infinite or minus infinite to a finite value. Uh, and this is one realization. Many other realizations ex exist. For example, Gritsev et al. have proposed to do it in condensates of interacting uh, atoms. And there are many systems. OK, so that's the question. And now we are beginning to work. I will introduce a representation of the massive Turing model due to Destry and De Vega, where they uh, define the model on a space-time lattice while maintaining the integrability of the model. So here you have uh, lines in space-time of right movers, lines left movers, 
uh, you have to think about it as spin degrees of freedom emanating from each vertex, which are uh, the spin degrees of freedom interact via microscopic transition amplitude that I've written here. And what they have shown is that if we take the continuum limit, namely the spacing delta, which is L over N, we take it fixed first, taking N and the size of the system L to infinity, holding, oops, sorry, holding a, the mass parameter fixed, then this model goes over via Jordan Wigner to the massive Turing model. So this is a very beautiful way of putting the uh, Hamiltonian or on a lattice in a way that you can handle it elegantly. So in this language now, you see time evolution, which means evolution in this direction, consists of two movements one to the right and one to the left. So I'm going, theta is a cutoff parameter, I should have mentioned it, which I sent to infinity at the end. So e to the i h delta, namely I move only one direction delta forward, consists of moving this way and this way by, an amount, by a matrix theta, which moves me this way, the whole line, and theta inverse, which moves me in the opposite direction forward. Again, product of these R matrices, which describes the local interaction in space-time of the left and right movers. And then if I want to evolve it to a time t, which is m times the amount delta, then all I have to take it to this expression to the power m, and I get the evolution Hamiltonian, E minus HT, a, this is a normalization, tau inverse tau to the power M. So what I have here is some initial state, let's say some spin configuration that I put initially at time t equals to zero, and then evolve in time successively by this operator, which is the time evolution operator until I reach a time t, at which point I take the overlap with the final state. So here, here is the description. In the spatial direction, I will take periodic boundary condition, some initial state, evolve it in time, and then take the overlap with the final state. So here is my a loss Schmidt amplitude, I start with phi i, evolve it in time with this uh, trans matrix of evolutions, and take the overlap with phi i in the end. I can simplify it with some identities, and uh, I rewrite it in a nicer way, and you see now this problem has become a classical two-dimensional lattice problem where you have, you are moving forward on a space-time lattice, which allows you to rewrite it in a more elegant way. So here is the original problem. I want to move phi i forward and end up with phi i. Let me do now a rotation in space-time and look at the problem um, in this direction. And think about this is now the time evolution in this direction. Then the states phi i, initial and final, become boundary condition on the time evolution of the state on a finite sequence. So in the, now what was spatial direction, namely here, that was here, now it becomes period, periodic in time, while what was, um, initial and final now become boundary condition on this time evolution. And therefore, the Loschmidt echo becomes, a, I have to take now a trace. What used to be a trace in space because of periodic 
boundary condition now becomes a trace in time of operators that evolve in this direction. So you can think about it as an open spin chain, but with the boundaries prescribed. I can have a finite size spin chain with boundaries prescribed in the beginning and the end, and the system evolves in time. So people sometimes call this a quantum transfer matrix. Okay, now, what initial conditions can we have? So, you see, this is the initial boundary condition, and it could be very complicated. It could be, it could be changed on any direction. If we want to be able to make progress, we have to choose some initial state that we can handle. So we are going to think about states that can be written as products of uh, two lines. So I'll have a state V on each double line that is a linear combination of a spin up, spin down on these uh, links here. And this is going to be my initial boundary condition. So that translates when you go back precisely to the states that I was talking about. If I choose the relation between C1 and C2, which relates spin up, spin down, and, uh, and down up, in a particular way, I will have in the bosonized language the ground state. If I choose them in the opposite a phase relationship, I will get maximally excited states. A, a point to make about comparison to experiment, for example, the superfluid mode transition is uh, the fact we are talking about an effective low energy like the Sine-Gordon model, but a Sine-Gordon model um, is a good description, let's say, of a Bose-Hubbard model for low energy. But I just explained that when you do a quench, you wander over the full space of the Hamiltonian, and then you have to worry whether uh, the post-quench Hamiltonian is still a good description of the original model like uh, the Bose-Hubbard model, but I will not discuss this issue now. Okay, so here is what I have to do then uh, to compute um, the Loschmidt echo in the limit where n, which is the size of the system, goes to infinity. Remember, this is the direction which now is periodic. Since n goes to infinity, then we know from particular work of Baxter that if I diagonalize this Hamiltonian, I get product of all eigenvalues to the power n, and in, if n goes to infinity, only lambda max will survive. So the question is then how to calculate the maximal eigenvalue of this transfer matrix in time. And of course, um, if we ask when would the lambda max coincide with the next um, eigenvalue, that is precisely the point where we have um, the dynamically quantum phase transition. Okay, so here comes a big technical jump, and uh, I may lose people here. Um, but I get lost when somebody shows me um, quantum Monte Carlo, doesn't explain how he does it. He shows, that's what I get. So here I have a machinery, that's what I get. Okay? However, this machinery is beautiful, and I recommend everybody to learn it. Um, learn the beauty of beta ansatz. So here is, I was telling you I, am, I want to know what is the maximal eigenvalue. So using this beautiful formalism, which has been developed over the years, um, it is given by this complicated expression, no reason to go into detail. The point is, that it is characterized by certain parameters, lambda one, 
to lambda m. Remember, m is a, the time. It's t over delta. And these beta parameters must satisfy this very complicated uh, beta ansatz equations. So you, this is a set of transcendental algebraic complicated, complicated equations, which you have to solve for lambdas. You end up solving for densities of lambdas. Once you have those densities, you can calculate this maximal eigenvalue, and then you get the Loschmidt echo. So again, technology, instead of solving directly this beta ansatz equation, uh, one introduces a technique uh, due to um, Destri and De Vega. One introduces an auxiliary function, A, which I've written down here. And if you look at it, and if you compare for, to this equation, I have written down a function which is such that the beta ansatz equation is given by A at, a, I'm, I have to look at values U that are equal to minus one. That, uh, all I did is bring this to the other side. I say that this product has to be equal to minus one, and then the lambdas have to be a solution. Of course, this equation depends on its own eigenvalues, which means that I have, I can translate it into a non-linear integral equations. Once I solve it, I can calculate what I want. I want to, uh, so the two states that I'm going to characterize are, character, uh, are given by phase i pi over two or zero. If you remember, this is the combination of up, down, down, up at the edge states. So the initial state, the quench from the ground state is characterized by psi uh, i pi over two, and the maximal excited state is psi equals to zero. So once I have found what is the, uh, this auxiliary function, then in a long appendix, we can prove that the log of the Loschmidt echo is very nicely expressed in terms of this integral. So it's given by minus i e naught t log f. So e naught t is the ground state energy of the post-quench Hamiltonian. f, remember, is the overlap. And here it's given exactly for these states. And integrals over uh, the auxiliary function and its inverse. So you see the auxiliary function uh, plays, in a sense, the role of density of states out of equilibrium. And you can see ex uh, in a very simple way the analog. So uh, remember that G was, namely the Loschmidt echo, was given by sum over n to e minus e n t c n square, where c n's were the overlaps. If I take the log, log of this, I get an expression minus i e naught t plus log c n square. So this is this expression. Uh, here is log of the uh, fidelity. And this complicated sum, which probes the full Hilbert space, weighted by the initial state, is now encoded in the auxiliary function. All right, Nathan. Oops, thank you. OK, so one writes a non-linear integral equation for the auxiliary function. And there is different physics uh, if the system is um, attractive or non-attractive. The boundaries that you have to integrate over in one case do not include poles. In the attractive case, they are going to include poles, which, uh, which tell us that we have bound states. And we can solve those equations. Uh, but to test them, we'll first do uh, the case of free fermions. It's just a sanity check. We'll 
choose beta square equals to four pi, in which case the sine Gordon model becomes a free model. We can solve explicitly the auxiliary function, plug it in uh, the expression for the Loschmidt echo and get a very nice expression for the echo and for the fidelity. And of course, since these are free field theories, we can obtain the same by doing simple Bogolyubov rotation. And Alessandro Silva did it already in 08, where he introduced many of the questions that I'm discussing here. We can find the work distribution for the free case when we start from a ground state. We do the Fourier transform of this expression. We find, as expected, a, a delta function for the um, in a f for the a multiplied by the fidelity, and here we find a, a critical exponent of half, characterizing the threshold. A work distribution for a quench, if I start from the maximal energy initial state, would be. Uh, similar but with new uh, thresholds and the critical exponent is going now to be minus three half. Okay, so let me now turn on interactions very quickly. Now I have a new auxiliary function, plug it in to um, compute the Loschmidt echo, do carry out a Fourier transform to obtain um, the momentum distribution, and we find the following results. Um, there are, turns out, again, they are characterized by critical exponent half for quench from a ground state, and minus three half for quench from uh, the maximal energy excitation. And here it's what it looks like. Around the threshold, we have this kind of behavior uh, the black line means no interaction. Turning on interaction, you see the effect is to reduce the power. Here, it's a, he, here you see the excitation, the distribution around the other um, initial state where you start from maximal energy. If we have attractive interaction, then poles appear in the expression for the um, auxiliary function, and we have new expressions which re for the work distribution, which reflect now that we can go this into the bound states. Uh, here is the initial threshold, critical exponents, and one can obtain an exact expression to any region. Uh, let me summarize. Uh, what I showed is how to calculate the Loschmidt echo in worst statistics for some quenches. I didn't discuss it, but for this particular initial state, we showed that there is no um, dynamical phase transition. Uh, we didn't have time to show that either new non-equilibrium dualities occur between strong and weak interactions and one can realize this quench in experiment. Many things to do, uh, connect, obtain other non-equilibrium thermodynamics, go into deeper description of the system, ca calculate the entropy production fluctuation theorem, um, show that this uh, non-linear integral equation uh, describes also how observables evolve in time. As I said, that this auxiliary function describes non-equilibrium density of states, which will describe how um, observables evolve. It's interesting to do it for small and large system. In small system, fluctuations are enhanced, and one can connect it with fluctuation theorems. It's interesting to do quench across critical points, study defect production, the Kibble-Zurich dynamics, scaling universality, uh, other type of quenches, either slow drives or floquet, periodic. So non-equilibrium is just at its infancy and uh, 
I hope you all contribute. Thank you very much. Thank you.